I say uh, we are we're good to go. So um, thank you for coming to today's uh, you know our session today on um, you know really our nutrient management within South Langley and in this particular recording is Barb Pearson from Sage and Solace Farm. She's joining us today to, to, to pretty much give her experience in rehabilitating a riparian area on her agricultural property in Langley, BC. Uh, she's done a lot of work um, on her farm. And if you do any kind of Google research with Sage and Solace, you will come, you will see a lot of the, the stunning beauty that her farm has. And uh, she's done a lot of work uh, in terms of that her riparian area to increase the water quality coming through her farm. So uh, this presentation series that we're doing in terms of webinars with LEPS, the Lee Environmental Partner Society, my name is Amanda. We are literally just uh, doing presentations in terms of reaching out to our local community and neighboring communities who um, are within certain areas that the water flows south um, into the state of Washington and uh, impacting other areas because water is fluid and everything does move around, especially in our time of climate change um, with all of our flooding. So uh, without um, any further delay, I'm going to pass it off to Barb Pearson. Um, and uh, Barb likes questions throughout, so please feel free to stop her as well because she's a very nice fluid person herself, like, like the water. Like all right, water. so uh, go right ahead, Barb. Okay, so this uh, discussion is going to be about what we did on our farm, which is 20 acres in uh, basically on 256th, and this was the land as it was when we purchased it. So this gives you a very good idea of the riparian area, which if you go to uh, the far right of the screen, I wish I had a little cursor here, but I don't, um, you can see a pond on the bottom, um, sort of midway across, and it's got a lot of algae on it, and it's got, um, it's all very little life anywhere on this farm when we purchased it. So the riparian area runs from the pond up the screen, across, and then down to the right-hand corner. So you can see that it is just completely not a tree, not a twig, not a plant. And so this area was all pasture, and there was nothing here at all except that pasture. And what they had done is they had used um, an herbicide to kill every single weed other than the grass. So it was a bit of a bleak situation. And when we came in, it was very, very important to us that we were going to work with the soil and the land and heal it as well as ourselves. So the the point was, is that we weren't going to use a single herbicide, pesticide, nothing, just the strength of our own beings. It was so it was my family and I, and we really had to learn as we went. So this is not a treatise on what to do exactly as we did it. Um, this is just what we did. It is, and I'm sure we made a lot of mistakes along the way, but what we have done has been quite remarkable in what has created a difference. So uh, we'll move to the next slide and you'll be able to see a better view of the riparian area from here. So what you're seeing is the view from the house. So you can see the pond. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, you're not being heard. Okay, sorry, we just have uh, Ali coming in right now. So Ali, just okay. to let you know, we are doing a recording. So it's up to you if you'd like to keep your video on or off. Okay, thank you. Should I keep going? Okay, so when you look at this property, you'll see that pasture was the primary concern here. Every inch that could possibly be grass was grass. The difficulty for that is that the soil was getting more and more eroded. And when we came on and we started testing the soil, there was a very, uh, very bad nutrient 
quality to it. And so we wanted to start planting vegetables and um, grow organically. So we were of a concern as to how to create soil that was going to sustain the vegetables and also improve the soil. So, but this is about riparian area. So we'll go look over at this photo. And if you go to the midway, you'll see a kind of black spot there and you'll see a teeny little bit of water on the side. And then it what looks like a ditch that goes off the property towards the trees. So that was, that's part of the Bertrand Creek watershed on our property. And uh, we did some research and we found out that there's two endangered species that are in this area, two endangered fish. And we thought that there's no way that anything could be alive in there because there, is, there was nothing alive. And our pond, as I showed you in the previous slide, was full of algae. And not that algae is kills everything, but the, the whole system together, there was no wildlife, there was no insects, there was nothing. And on top of that, that black hump there over in the about midway through to the left, that was where they put all their garbage and buried it and burnt it right there, right in the middle of the riparian area. So we didn't think that that was exactly appropriate. Uh, so we got a big machine and we took as much of that garbage out and we found stuff that went back 50 years. And so we got that all out of there and we cleaned it all up and we brought in uh, proper soil. So next, um, the, to, to figure out what we're doing here, you have to understand that our pond is about a third of an acre in size. And um, it had nothing around it except banks that were getting more and more eroded. And so it had a couple of alder trees, which were keeping those banks at least there a little bit. So if we go to the next photo here, it gives a close up of what I was showing you before. So this is the riparian area. I planted the tree, the trees that you see there, uh, there's three of them. There were no trees and we were grazing animals, hence the white fence. And we were doing rotational grazing. So we wanted to bring the animals onto the pasture and move them around and follow them by poultry and so on so that we create an, a little bit of a ecosystem and bring in the bugs and so on. But if this is your riparian area, you know, we didn't want to get too close with our animals because we didn't want our animals shitting in the supposed area that was going over into the water. And we really thought that this needed some help. So what to do? That's the next question. So you can see that uh, lone bird sitting there going, shaking its head, thinking, wow, there's nothing to eat here and there's not a single plant or seed or anything. And that made me very sad. So I started researching about what would improve a riparian area. And I went to the Fraser Valley Conservancy and Amanda is going to give you the link. And it is a document that, um, it's called Gardening with Native Plants in the Lower Mainland and Fraser Valley. And it has a list in it that has every single native plant that you could possibly plant around here that would assist your environment and the conditions that they need. So whether it needs, whether it can grow in a watery area, whether it can grow in a dry area and so on. So then you ask yourself, well, why plant native plants? So, I wanted to plant native plants and I started bringing them in by the thousands, literally. Oops, I went too far. So that's me. And um, I wanted, I contacted someone at the Fraser Valley Conservancy and I highly recommend talking to them because they're very knowledgeable. And I asked them, as I moved here from, I moved to the farm from a condo in downtown Vancouver. And I didn't know anything. So anybody can do this if I can. That's the moral of the story. So what's happened is people are bringing in more and more plants from other countries. And these countries um, 
their growing conditions are completely different than ours. So something that may not be invasive in Asia, for example, could be completely invasive here because it has more water or more something, or it, it can be the opposite. But whatever it is, it's causing huge problems in the Fraser Valley. There's farms that have extremely invasive problems, and I'm not going to get into that right now, but I didn't want to make that mistake. So the native plants, uh, for those of those who don't know the definition, they're plants that occur naturally in a region where they evolved. And so they're the ecological basis upon which all life depends, including birds and including people. So without them, um, then the birds cannot survive. And so what was happening on our place is we moved to this huge piece of property and there are no birds and I found that extremely strange because I came from downtown Vancouver and there was far more birds there than there was in the middle of this farming community so um, the landscape choices that you make have very meaningful effects on the populations of birds and the insects that need to survive in the area so I highly recommend that you look into that and start putting those things in. So after doing that um, and starting to put pot trees in, we realized that the trees along these swales, as they're called, uh, why they're called swales, I'm not sure, but they all the water from up above us uh, to the south drains through these swales and then goes into the Bertrand Creek. So that must be the water that's somehow coming all the way from Washington and comes all the way down the hill to us. And I wanted to create little ecosystems. So each tree that goes in creates an ecosystem. It has a place for the birds to land. So instead of flying across 20 acres and being in danger from other predators and such, the bird now has a place to land and can sit in that tree. So it was literally within the same summer as planting these trees all over on the swales that the birds started coming in and we counted species after species start to come in the more plants that we put in so we started with the big trees and uh the next thing we wanted to approach on as you can see on this slide here is we were um breeding we got birds that were on the endangered species list. And it was our passion to bring in birds that were already endangered and try to create a habitat for them. But this pond wasn't the best habitat. As you can see, it looks pretty disgusting. So, well, what do we do with that? So we researched and researched. We thought about getting fish. We thought about getting um, products to put in it, but every product that we looked at seemed to have a downside. And we didn't want to hurt our birds. And uh, there's also many wild birds flying into our pond area now. So what we did is we started looking into um, what it was that could deal with that algae. We tried a couple of different natural products and there's some very good ones out there, but that isn't what this particular talk is about. So if you're interested, you can ask me those questions, but the other thing we wanted to do is bring in the pollinators. And so we put in literally um, thousands of flowers. And uh, then what ended up happening is we were very fortunate because I was at a movie one night and um, the woman behind me uh, overheard a conversation that I was having with a fellow farmer. And uh, she asked me if they could bring their sick beehives in from UBC uh, to rehab them on our property since we were all organic. So here's an example of an echinacea with a bee on it. And now when you come to our property, there are probably on each flower, there's four to five bees. It's quite spectacular. So here's another example of some of the plants that we put in on the right, obviously sunflowers, hundreds of sunflowers bring in habitat for the birds because they can all live within. They have a huge food source. On the left is the Nutka Rose and that Nutka Rose 
um, is grows in a very dry habitat. It never needs to be watered. The rose hips are a fantastic source of energy for, for the animals and for the insects. And we put that all the way around our pond. It also beautified our pond. And it started to get to the point where we are now at this situation where when you look at our property, very different from the first slide that you saw, uh, all the trees have matured some in the last couple of years. We have a place where people can sit and enjoy the pond. The other thing that was important to create life for or, or to help the health of the pond was to put in uh, big boulders because what that does is it stops the erosion on the sides. It gives the wildlife a chance to crawl onto that rock or um, stand on the rock. And so when the water level comes up, they're actually on those rocks on a regular basis, drinking the water instead of trying to go into the clay sides. Because our pond is 100% clay. It's not got a lining and it gets very uh, muddy. And what's the other word that you would say? It feels like quicksand. So if you walk onto it, you're gonna go down very quickly. So I am assuming that even though the bird is light or the deer or whatever it is, it does the same thing. So these rocks are very useful to the wildlife. And uh, by bringing in the, by allowing this wild or all of these natural plants, not natural plants, native plants to grow, the number of bird species that have increased on our property uh, just what I counted this past year, we have 10 new species from what we had last year. And that is very encouraging to me because that is exactly what I've been after. So next, uh, I've got some slides of some of the plants that we put along the actual riparian areas. So now you see, instead of it just being um, sprayed by weed killer, it is lush with plants. So this was taken in November. And in November, it is still this lush. So after uh, four months of fairly intense drought, July, August, September, October, yeah, good four months of intense drought, these plants have been able to thrive and they've never been watered. So these particular red osier dogwoods we got from LEPS because LEPS has a regular um, program where they will give plants to people who want to put them into their property. So we took advantage of that and got as many as we could and promptly came home and I planted every single one of them. And I could use, because of the size of my property, I could use, you know, a thousand of them. But we start with this. and. Um, Again, the birds are living in here. The insects are living in here. We have lots of native frogs now instead of just the bullfrogs, which are not native to our land. And it has becoming a thriving community. So next I've got another um, photo here of this is well into the drought. So this was taken this past September. And this is what I'm talking about. The pond got way, way down. And so you can see that the clay is drying out, but there still is water left. And the bubbles there are created by our aerator. And the aerator was something that after doing a lot of research, we realized that that would really help improve the water quality. And this is how it does it. Um, aeration circulates the oxygen that is in a pond. And so oxygen, without the oxygen, the bacteria builds up. And with a lot of bacteria, you get the algae. So when the algae in the pond starts to die off, that bacteria moves in to decompose the dead algae. And this oxygen speeds up that decomposition process. So the algae um, decomposes more quickly and leaves far more harmful byproducts. So the beauty of this is even though this water basically is only a foot deep by now, we figure at most it's two feet at the bottom, it's looking clear. 
and that was never the case in the last years that we were here it just looked like a big sludge and so you can see we also put in cattails the cattails create habitat for more animals uh the ducks the wild ducks and geese nest in there along with our own and you can see over to the left the rocks which now of course are quite a bit up the bank but the pond itself, considering that it hasn't had any fresh water come into it for a long time, is uh, looking pretty darn good. So this is a view from the pond towards our house. And again, it shows uh, this is November before there's been any rain. And so you can see the lushness and the green and how many places there are for uh, insects and birds to get in here. And when you walk through here, you just hear them. It's, it's like a cacophony of music and I love it. It makes me very happy. We also put in willow trees because the willows feed on the water and helped stop some of the water that, that was coming out in flood times. And they also are very beautiful and give places for those birds to stop. So this is the side of the pond on the left side so that you can see what we did to the sides there. We put in more native plants. So we added um, mock orange, red elderberry. Uh, we put in goat's beard. We put in Douglas aster. Uh, we, we put in all things that could survive the type of clay soil. Not everything did extremely well. Um, you know, this past year, if, if this wasn't a challenge, I don't know what was. I've never seen such dry conditions. Mind you, I've only been at this for five years, but uh, it was, we put in thimbleberry, um, as many things as we could think of, we put in and, and we recorded how they were doing. And you can see that, that this area is lush compared to what it was in the first slide. So, Another example of the side of the pond with a swale, the trees are now growing up. Um, I'm famous for putting in old pieces of metal into my land because I love the architectural elements that it lands or lends to the property. So that's why this bed frame is there. I had it all full of sunflowers for the birds to eat. And here again, this is winter after four months of drought. And if you see the difference between this and if we go back to the first area here, quite a difference. So we're happy campers. And again, one more view of the area. There's flowers for the pollinators and there are grasses and we're putting in all season plants. So there's constantly blooms from early in the spring and this is November and there's still blooms and we have a steady supply of not just um, honeybees that UBC brought over, but we have many, many native pollinators. I think I've counted um, at least 22 different varieties, but I'm sure there's probably more. So when you look at our property now, this is it. Um, this is as of 2022. And so you'll see now when you look down at the pond, down on um, kind of in the middle, down to the bottom of the frame, the pond is completely clear. And there is, uh, this is a satellite view, of course, so you don't see all the plants that I just showed you, but the riparian area is lush and green, and this is in the middle of a drought. You can see trees lining the driveway. You can see trees lining our swales. And you can see the massive amounts of gardens that we've put in for pollinator conservation and also for habitat for anything that wants to live in this area. And one of the things that's near and dear to my heart is diversity. So we have over a thousand different species growing on our property. 
And one of the most interesting things is that we work with a, um, another person from UBC who is a, she does um, organic farm chemistry and she comes and she looks at the bugs that are on our farm, the bad bugs and tries to record what they are. We don't have any, we just haven't had any. When everybody else was having mosquitoes this past summer, we didn't have any mosquitoes. So our neighbors had tons of mosquitoes. They couldn't even go out on their deck. Our property didn't have mosquitoes. I don't know why. I suspect it's because we had thousands of dragonflies, thousands of insects that were eating the mosquitoes because we have standing water. <laughs> so our tomatoes don't have pests. Our raspberries don't have pests. Our vegetables don't have pests. And the only thing that she can figure out, and she's the expert, I'm not, but it's because we have so much diversity and we also do a lot of companion planting. So there's a lot of topics that I've covered here and I'm very willing to answer some questions, uh, but that in a nutshell, I don't know how long I've taken Amanda, but that in a nutshell is um, my project. Uh, yeah, you're 30 minutes in, so you've got oh, wow. some extra time. Yeah, you did it all within 30 minutes, but okay. um, I know that you do have some folks with us now. Uh, we have okay. a, another person who's joined us that could potentially have some questions. Um, or if you have uh, more detail you want to go into, you have time for that. So not, not a rush tonight. Well, maybe people could tell me if they, uh, the ones that are, are standing by here, if there's any particular inter area that interests them and I can elaborate on that. Hi, I'm Veronica. <clears throat> I'd have my video on, but if I do, I'll, uh, it'll, I won't have it, I'll disappear. Completely. Okay. <laughs> no problem. No, enough. no problem. You can, you, you can just go right ahead. And I think what yeah. we'll do is we'll, we'll fill some time with some questions just so you know, let, let everybody know. Um, yeah. And there will be a time, we'll give it a, probably about 15 minutes and then I'll turn the recording off. So if you want to show your video at that point and have more conversation, we can. Oh, to so go right, go right ahead, Ron. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, no, it's a very, uh, uh, it, you're doing really good work. I like, I like, um, what you've described and and your and and what you've done to create a good space for um, all kinds of critters, and um, I would I would just say that because of what you've created, you have all the prey and predator presence. So hence, you don't have mosquitoes because you're taking care of the environment in an in an ecological way, or you know, with ecology in mind, and. Um, so hence you don't need to add things like um, inorganic fertilizers or pesticides because you, you're letting nature control things. Yeah, you know, I don't use any any of that. Yeah, you uh, we make it. our own compost Yeah, from our plants and we've added some uh, things, uh, what's it called, biochar or whatever, we tried that. Um, yeah but it didn't seem to make a huge difference and it's very expensive and so what we thought we would do is because we're not growing um like like i'm you know what i must say here to other farmers that are going to be listening to this is we have the luxury uh we have a goat dairy and so our oh. goats go out on pasture you don't see them in any of this but hence all the pasture and i uh, so what we're trying to do is not grow vegetables for market and have massive amounts of them. So we're fortunate. We don't need to pay our bills by growing vegetables. So those people may need to need fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides. I'm not making any judgments on any of that. I'm just saying that for us coming to this property, when I got here, I was incredibly ill. And that was the reason why we moved here. And my, the most important thing was creating an environment that was as pure as possible. And it has paid off in spades, not just for the insects and the birds and the animals that we have, but also for us humans, it's made a difference that you wouldn't believe. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. It's, um, <clears throat> well, I do, um, I do soil analysis. That's, that's ah. how I, how I, um, make my way. And, um, so I look at soil for its, um, microbial counts, biomass and ratios of the four major primary, um, microorganism groups i'd love to have you come over <laughs> oh yeah i'd be I'd, I'd i'd be very interested given um what you've described my guess is is that your soil um should show the same kind of diversity that you're showing above ground because it all I'm starts below ground yeah <laughs> it's it's getting there um there it was very hard dried out clay in most areas yep so every time we introduce something, we're trying to, um, you know, use the compost. We're trying to, because the clay was so terribly hard, we had to do some digging and some tilling to even get, uh, plus, plus the whole place was pasture. So how do you get rid of pasture to start a garden? You have to get it, you have to tear it up and till it. So, but what we've noticed now is that when I put a shovel in to go in, it's full of earthworms. And I, I obviously don't, can't see with my naked eye, um, all the microorganisms, but, no. but the soil just looks like it is, it feels much lighter, loamier and so on. And, and we're getting there, not all the areas of our farm by any stretch, but it's a big farm. <laughs> so it's a very labor intensive yeah well when you create space for um nature to do its thing your soil exactly. will decompact because the biology decompacts your soil so putting on the rich composts um um and treating it as you as you you know describe you're gonna you're gonna end up with a nice loamy soil yeah, and when we when I mean, we that, that subject is so huge. Like I just went to a day long uh, field trip with um, on cover cropping with uh, farm folk, city folk. Oh, it was oh. a fabulous workshop, and there is an awful lot to learn. But we are cover cropping, and it it just amazes me when I look around again. You know how how much stuff is blowing around right like where is all this dust coming from and what is going on and and uh so yeah it's a, it's a subject that's very important to me is improving the soil because without that uh we don't have very much yeah yeah no that's <clears throat> that's exactly on that note work. i'm going to show my last slide oh this is the slide of the pond just to see the lushness but my very last slide is many of the things, um, you know, this is the famous quote by Albert Einstein, but it's the things that you can't count that really matter. And that's what you're saying, you know, what's inside the soil, those microorganisms that nobody can see and nobody thinks of, that's what really matters. And I just thought this slide was so appropriate. I, I don't think he was talking about soil, but who knows, maybe. <laughs> I think he has talked about soil though. Oh, has he? Okay. Yeah, yeah, he has. Um, I'll have to pull that quote and, and retain it for next time because he, I, I remember it was a quote used in one of the studies that I did was ah. by Albert Einstein. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, soil, we come from soil. Microbes built this planet. They know what they're doing if we allow them to live, but when we knock off the microbes in our soil and they die off, we become dependent on <clears throat> inorganic fertilizers. And uh, well, we all know that they're 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 very fossil fuel dependent, hence the cost of them going up exponentially. And when nature can't do what nature does, we end up with infestations and diseases, and then people lean on pesticides in order to protect their um, income. But there are other methods. And these days, it seems like it doesn't matter if we use pesticides or not. <laughs> you know, farming's having a real hard times to um, take care of itself. It's true. Given, it given all the things that it's being hit by right now. Yeah. 
Um, I have in the chat here, um, if Susan wants to share her first comment there, uh, I, I've cleared you time. If you want to vocalize it, it probably would be better coming from you because so Susan just joined about 20 minutes late. So she kind of missed um, a little bit of the presentation, but her comment there um, will be very easy for you, Barb, to answer. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. It's nice to see you again, Barb. I really yes. enjoyed your flower arranging, uh, arranging uh, day. And um, I don't know if you remember, but I gave the bouquet to my daughter for her 19th birthday. I and, do remember. Yeah, it was dahlias and it just it was stunning. So um, as I'm mentioning here in the comments, I'm now finally getting my farm Bambi legs and uh, flower farming is where I want to start because something that I'm familiar with and I also love. Um, my soil is sand with rocks, it's river rock. And from what I'm learning, we used to be the Fraser River. Ah. Back in the day, we were the, the Fraser Valley was the Fraser River and that's why we have this river rock. So um, it's wonderful for drainage, not, not uh, nutrient rich. Um, but then I'm contending with blackberries, so I'm learning about, you know, the lasagna method. I'm, uh, I have a great connection for uh, cardboard, and I'm, as soon as I get that all laid down, and then I've got another connection for some mushroom manure, I'm excited to get that all down so that it can compost, and then hopefully in spring I can lay some seed in there and get going. Nice. Uh, I put some raised beds in, just to give myself a, a jump start and, and paid for, you know, um galvanized steel beds and created a pattern to is my jumping off point for a design uh, but i also have a slew on my property and um the property has been in my family for 50 years it's my property now i'm a one woman show one woman two hands is what my yep. hashtag is <laughs> because i'm basically doing all the work with a rake i've broken a few and i've broken wheelbarrows and i've broken a few tools um, but I'm very mindful uh, and respectful of the land. And when I excavated last last summer, not this summer that we just passed, but the summer before, I made uh, very careful decisions on which trees stayed. And of course, any in decline came out, any that were dead came out. But I created a road through to the back, but respecting the gorgeous soaring maples, indigenous dogwoods. Um, old growth forest of evergreens are all maintained and I know that if someone else would have purchased that property that wouldn't have been the case so my heart is a thousand percent invested here I um, I want I need to contend with those blackberries I, I need to address the slough which is surrounded blackberries but I do have a beautiful picture I don't know if I can share it here of uh, the winter last year of uh, what the, the slough came back and it's frozen over and there were some duck, ducks etc it was just absolutely breathtaking very pretty but then of course you know with the with the um dry weather it i thought it i thought it was gone i thought it was gone with global warming but it's not it's actually still there so i would love to do what you've done barb on your property is absolutely amazing I want to respect that slew just like I've respected the trees and and give it its presence, respect the riparian, repair the riparian edge. Uh, I know there's green froggies there because I've got a picture of one, a little green froggy in my hand um, that I've been documenting. And, and, you know, I'm a big believer in invasive species that cover, that carry disease like mosquitoes and flies. We have the answer here. Mother Nature has gifted us the answer with frogs and, and other species that'll take care of them if we only pay attention and protect those species. So I'm not I don't I'm not a scientist. I'm just a person with a heart. Right. And that's all I have to oh, offer. Me, right me too. Yeah. I got that we were kind of kindred spirits when I met you. And yeah. um I have talked to um person in Leps there I'm hoping you know, we're going to have a meeting is that you 
Is that is it Veronica? I'm sorry, I can't see your name. No, it's Amanda. My name, hey. my name is Amanda. I know. Amanda. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't rename my. Um, so I, I'm. I'm Leps. That's that's who I'm representing. But I am Amanda. <laughs> Great to meet you, uh, Amanda. So we will have our meeting, and you can see my sloop. Sometimes you can't yeah. even find it. It's kind of <laughs> hidden in amongst brambles and stuff. Right. Yeah. No, I think that I, I'm really happy that you guys all kind of came together and Veronica, you especially because you're very um, uh, knowledgeable with soils. And I think you've added a great benefit to the conversation uh, tonight. So I think that that's wonderful. And I hope that Ali, you may have gained even some further information, um, but I will see you on Tuesday. But uh, is there any other questions for Barb at all? You'll see me on Tuesday or Veronica? Uh, I see Allie on Tuesday, and then I'm going to be talking to you oh. via email to set up a date for you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Was there any, I, any other questions? I have, a, I have a question. Have you done any um, any um, counts on on the reptarians that are inhabiting the pond currently? Like the, how many newts um, you might no. have in the area? Or oh, okay. That, no, that could be we, very interesting data. We had, um, we would like to, like, like we've been going pretty well full tilt, just trying to develop the property and get it to the place where it is right now. So we've got a lot of projects in the works, but, but haven't done that. And the other thing that we want to do is do way more soil testing all over, all over the property. Now that we've finished the sort of the key components Oh, so okay. I, I'm serious. I'd love to talk to you at some point. So, oh yeah, I have a website. It's called Microbial Planet Analytics. <clears throat> okay. And I'll be out there next week on, but I, I won't have time. I'm coming out for that cover, another cover crop workshop. Okay. Workshop. Yeah. I tried to go to the one that you went to, but I couldn't get there. Um, but I'm really sorry. I missed it. It sounds great. I'm just going to stop uh, the recording yeah. now and so you guys can free speak. So what I'll oh. do for the purposes of this recording is say thank you everybody for joining us tonight and uh, I will turn off the recording so if, if you want to show your face then you're not going to be recorded and we will share this to our YouTube channel but I will also send you guys all the, the link to this recording so I'll stop recording now. Thank you Amanda and Barb and everyone. Yeah thank you. Okay, I, we I'd are... share my face 